The world's biggest albatross has just been placed around the neck of the Tory party. The scandal of their donors' remarks, which the Prime Minister has finally called racist after sending junior ministers out to say they weren't, has sunk to a new level. Inside sources have told the papers this is the last straw for Sunak and the no-confidence letters are starting to tumble in through Sir Graham Brady's letterbox. Is this the end for Sunak's wet fuse premiership? Here's what Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer had to say. The highest tax burden since the Second World War. I did listen to the charts. They're £46 billion of unfunded commitments. They tried that under the last administration and everybody else is paying the price. Yeah. And two weeks ago, the Prime Minister promised to crack down on those spreading hate. Today, he shrunk at the first challenge. Yeah. Last week, he promised fantasy tax cuts. Now he's pretending it can all be paid for with no impact on pensions or the NHS. Yes. All we need now, Mr Speaker, is an especially hardy lettuce, and it could be 2022 <laughs> all over again. Is it any wonder that he's too scared to call an election yeah. when the public can see that the only way to protect their country, their pension and their NHS from the madness of this Tory party yeah. is by voting Labour? Well, um, he wants people to vote Labour. He would ask them to do anything. Funnily enough, tonight, uh, the Labour Party actually put out a fundraising cry to all of their members using this £10 million pound donor um, as, a, as an excuse, but there we are. Joining me now, uh, we've got the panel here. Uh, Telegraph columnist Madeline Grant is here as well. Uh, we'll come to you guys in a moment. Madeline, um, you were probably in the Prime Minister's uh, room this, this, this afternoon when Prime Minister's questions were going on. It got a bit vitriolic, um, all sorts of accusations flying backwards and forwards. It's now getting to the point where, you know, racism, Islamophobia, as we were saying last night, is now the order of the day, um, instead of all of the things that actually are really wrong with the country. Yes, it does increasingly feel like PMQs is 35 minutes of every week where it basically consists of the two main parties pointing at each other and saying, no, your party is racist. No, your party is racist. And that's not to excuse the you know outrageous racist remarks made by the Tory donor or any of the other scandals that have erupted over the last few weeks, but it feels like we're always in mudslinging mode and the issues of real substance facing the country, these are just too difficult to discuss. So we go back to the mudslinging. Right. And I mean, perhaps towards ever thus, but certainly it feels like this is the new order of the day at PMQs more than um, in any time that I've been sketching it, certainly. Yeah, exactly right. Well, I mean, Star Wars spent a long time having to go um, at Rishi Sunak. Let's see what Rishi Sunak had to say. Finally, back to him. I think we've got that. Have we got that? Go on. The alleged comments were wrong, they were racist, and he has now, as I said, the comments were wrong, they were racist. He has rightly apologised for them, and that remorse, and that remorse should be accepted, Mr Speaker. There is no place for racism in Britain, and the government that I lead is living proof of that. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the man bankroll and the Prime Minister also said that the member for Hackney North should be shot. How low would he have to sink? What racist, woman-hating threat of violence would he have to make before the Prime Minister plucked up the courage to hand back the £10 million that he's taken from him? And here's what Rishi Sunak had to say back to him. Mr Speaker, as I said, the gentleman apologised genuinely for his comments, and that remorse should be accepted. But he talks about language. He, he might want to reflect on the double standards of his deputy leader, of his deputy leader calling her opponent scum, Mr. Speaker. His shadow, his shadow, his shadow foreign secretary, the shadow foreign secretary, comparing conservatives to Nazis, Mr. Speaker, and the man that he wanted to make chancellor. The man that he wanted to make Chancellor talking about lynching a female minister. His silence on that speaks volumes. It's all rather unedifying, really, isn't it, Madeline? It's not what we expect from them. Well, I mean, I, I watch it every week, so I have come to expect it. But <laughs> um, yes, I and none of that, none of these, none of the Prime Minister's defences there really work because it's such familiar stuff. Every single week he falls back on these same defences. Um, you know, you you tried to make Corbyn prime minister, etc. And it's not that there isn't some truth to all of that, but 
I think in response to, I think he would have actually been better off acknowledging um, the point that Keir Starmer was making and maybe saying, you know, we're sorry that on behalf of him or, or something. But, you know, it's just, it's very difficult to win in these situations, I suppose. But it does beg the question of, you know, at what point is it possible for someone to say a really outrageous thing in the public sphere and have some kind of future, you know, not being utterly cancelled from, right. from, from public life? Well, that, you is know, is it that, that is an important Sorry, point. But... Because, you know, people who have been absolutely banging the drum and saying that this guy is the worst human being that ever walked the earth, say he's a public figure, he wasn't, say that he said it in public, he didn't. You know, I'm not in any way condoning what he said, but he said it in a private meeting uh, and nobody's ever heard of him until this week. So, you know, it's not as if it's somebody like uh, David Lammy saying it or it's not as if it's somebody like Diane Abbott saying it and it's not as if it's somebody like Jeremy Hunt saying it. That would be different. So... As I say, nobody wins in this because they all stick. The only thing that I thought was interesting as well was Diane Abbott, as we saw in some of those clips, was wanting to be called to speak. But, of course, under the new rules of the House of Commons, the Speaker doesn't want anybody to say anything controversial, so they didn't call her. Yeah, and I wonder if... Um, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what was going through the Speaker's head there, but I, I almost wonder if it they might have some kind of reluctance to call people who have themselves lost the whip. Um, you know, Lee Anderson has lost the whip. Um, or had lost the whip until he joined the Reform Party. Diane Abbott was, had lost the whip some time ago for, ironically, having downplayed another form of racism, anti-Semitism. Right. So I don't know if maybe there is some kind of, you know, policy of not choosing those independent MPs. I, I don't know. It's it's clearly enraged a lot of MPs that the Speaker did that and failed to call, call her up. And actually, yeah. um, obviously, a few weeks ago, um, the Speaker got into huge trouble because of his break with protocol. Mm. So there's now quite a sizable chunk of MPs who are angry with him for many different reasons. Yeah. Doesn't surprise me. It's all Madeline Grace to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, let's continue this with the panel. Uh, the Henry Jackson Society's Megan Gittos, editor of Spikes Online, Tom Slater, and Talk TV's estimable contributor, Esther Kreku. Welcome to all of you. I mean, I suppose in, in context, um, it now means that the House of Commons, like the rest of the country, doesn't work properly either because they don't do what they're supposed to do. They don't call the person that is at the centre of all of this to speak. Um, and all they do is slag each other off for being racist. It's a joke, isn't it? Yeah, I actually think she should have been called to no, speak. The whole session was should. about her. Yeah. So of course she should have been called right. to speak. How can you say, well, of course, it might have been controversial or she doesn't have the whip or, you know, we don't want to cause any trouble. She's still Ridiculous. an elected member and the conversation yeah. was about her. Of course she should have been called it was to speak. It was incredibly condescending, but I think it's because she, she might be a bit unhinged because yes. she asked... <laughs> allegedly, uh, Keir Starmer for the whip back. And he was like, I understand. He's like, right. OK, can I have the whip back? But I understand. Yeah. And I'm sure in his head he was thinking, hold on, why would I give you the whip back as a sort of a consolation prize? Because some guy yes. five years ago said he thinks you should be shot. Right. Particularly I mean, under the circumstances. I mean, they've given Andy McDonald the whip back, I think, today, mm -hmm. um, who actually probably shouldn't have had it taken off him because even though he used the phrase from the river to the sea, mm -hmm. he actually had the sentence that ended with for both Israelis and Palestinians. So, I mean, you know, that's a, maybe a slightly different thing, Tom. But, mm -hmm. but it is kind of, um, a, kind of abominable and slightly shameful that this is the best we can turn up with on a Prime Minister's questions on a Wednesday. No, I think that's right. And I was really struck by it watching it today, where you've got all of these problems in society. You've got the economy being in the state that it's in. You've got the world being in the state that it's in. And we've just got both sides of the House mm. of Commons accusing each other of being racist. Yeah. It's not to say, as we've been talking about, that these issues are unimportant, no. that what Diane Abbott said was unimportant, that what this Tory donor idiot said was right. unimportant. It's just the fact that the, the fact that politics have been reduced to this yeah. for the whole week now. Well, I mean, and also, it, it, it is unimportant. Like, let's, let's call a spade a spade. In the grand scheme of things, this is very unimportant. Mm. People are not going to be talking about this a few weeks before the election, which might be right now, actually. Um, <laughs> and, and this is the point. We know that this is wrong. We know that the Tories completely botched their response, trying to say, oh, it's a little bit racist, but it's not really racist. OK, fine, we get that. Right. But people have real concerns in this country, and it's so discouraging to see that the, both, both major parties just do not get it. The right. disconnect from the public. It's like, do you live in the same right. country as the rest of us? But also, it's almost like they're forcing everybody else to talk about racism. When, I mean, I don't think about racism every single day of the week. I don't think about it really at all. And it's rather ironic to me that having watched Prime Minister's questions for probably more decades than I care to remember, there are very many fewer white faces there now than there used to be. It used yeah. to be a completely white chamber. It's not now. So why are they all shouting racism all the time? Well, I think in a way, and you were getting into it Madeline Grant there about how it's become a bit of a kind of displacement activity. I mean, the Tory party, what does it have to discuss? I mean, if Rishi Sunak was riding high in the polls or comfortable with yeah. the polls even, this story would have come and gone quite quickly, I imagine. But because of the fact that 
the Tory party under Rishi Sunak is a kind of dead man walking. Yes. Things like this can easily take up the whole news agenda. And then you've got Labour, the Labour Party who don't really want to say anything other than to try and catch out the Tories on anything they can. So we've yeah. just got this really asinine debate all the time. This is just the latest iteration of it. Yeah, I mean, Harry Cole said today that he's, he's calling this one of the darkest lows of... Uh, the, the parliament that we've had in the past 14 years, including the actually, sort of dark days of Theresa May. Yeah, I actually said this to a friend a couple of weeks ago that because she said she kind of likes the historic quips that would be Prime Minister's questions. Yes. But it's 30 minutes of these quips that they think are funny. Public schoolboy debates. Yeah, yeah, and it's boring. Like, I watched Prime Minister... I can't watch it anymore. It's, they're not... As you say, they're not talking about things that matter. No. They're completely... They're it's, completely and it's not funny, and it's quite it's nasty now. funny, and it's quite nasty. getting nasty. Neither of them are any of life's great what? showmen, either. Yeah, <laughs> they to be front. They haven't even got just, that to It's just a on. glimpse to what politics will be so long as this crop of this generation of politicians mm. continues to stay in power. Because if any of them had a big vision, a big compelling vision for Britain, they would be shouting it from the roof tops. Mm. But to see that week in, week out, this is the quality and the standard of the debate that we get, we actually know that Britain is heading into darker times. Yeah. Because this is probably going to be the, the status quo for the next few years, no mm. matter who's elected. Right. And how about this, right? This actually comes from inside the Tory party, again, from Harry Cole. Some people are saying seven months is a long time in politics. Just imagine what would happen if England won the Euros. <laughs> Team GB had a hat full of gold at the Olympics. <laughs> the landscape could be very different. I mean, do they really think people are that stupid? <laughs> but, well, you know, <laughs> we won the Euros, let's vote Tory. To, to yeah. be honest, I, like, look, it's a really stupid thing to say, but it, it, there's some truth in it. There is. We know that about polls. There is. Give, give people a nice summer, like the summer of 2020, really hot with the Euros. There is some Lots of England flags. Like, we did go... The Labour Party yeah. do feel uncomfortable with England flags. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> there yeah. is some yeah. truth well, in it. Yeah. Because it's not... The, the mood right now in the country, as you say, it's dire. It's, it's dire. dire. And it's reflective in, in that what is looks like a cesspit. And this is what happens when you govern based on Twitter. You start right. acting yeah. like it. Yeah.